Well, good evening. Welcome to the Broward Center and thanks for everybody joining us virtually through Zoom. Um, welcome to our first Arts for Action Black Voices program. Tonight's program is called Bridging the Gap, a conversation about race and the performing arts. It's all part of the Arts for Action Black Voices project, which will be happening here at the Broward Center and throughout our community over the next year and is funded with support from the Community Foundation of Broward. Now, we all know that the arts can be a powerful tool for storytelling. It can affect social change. It can give us different perspectives on important issues in our world. When we experience the arts, the performing arts at least, we often start by listening, by observing, and letting it all affect us. That's how we want this program to go. These are great artists up here. They're not gonna perform for us tonight, but we wanna listen. We wanna observe. We wanna participate in a discussion and we ultimately want it to affect us in a way that will result in action. If we don't get action out of this program, then we haven't achieved everything that we want to achieve. So I want all of us to be listening, to be taking in what these guys have to offer, and take it in with empathy, with understanding, and hopefully leave with a better perspective on race and the performing arts in a way that you didn't understand it before. I want to thank all of these artists for participating here. They are fantastic performing artists in their own right, but what makes them special is that they understand that they can use art and their skill and their talent to positively affect their community in many ways. All of them here participate as educators and they inspire folks in our community as activists and they're all willing to participate here tonight to further this important discussion for our community and our society. So I thank all you guys for participating. Darius and Cindy have been working with us on a couple of things through the past year during this pandemic uh, as our partners. So I thank them for that. And Will and Kev got us started on this whole idea of Arts for Action Black Voices, inspired the idea and are now here tonight helping us make it a reality. So I thank you guys for that. Um, before I get started, I wanna thank a couple other sponsors and then I'll introduce our moderator. BBX Capital Foundation and JM Family Enterprises have both provided support along with the Community Foundation for Arts for Action Black Voices. And so thanks to our artists, and I'd like to now introduce uh, one of your favorite journalistic broadcasters and a friend of the Broward Center, Nikki Mohan, our moderator tonight. Nikki, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Kelly, so much and uh, welcome everyone tonight. We started having these conversations about a year ago, and I'd have to say that in the middle of the pandemic with everything that was going on, we were empowered to have really uncomfortable conversations that we hope will lead to change in our arena and then spread to our little corner of the world. And already here, um, we've talked about here at the Broward Center having a pipeline for diverse talent so that the world of arts and equity begins to look different because of the work and the conversations we're having here. Our panel tonight has so many great ideas on how to make that happen, as well as all the experiences and obstacles they faced along the way. So let me introduce you to them. Right here to my left is Mr. Kev Marcus, one half of the international recording group, Black Violin. He is also a father and an educator and a philanthropist. The other half of Black Violin, Mr. Will Baptiste. And next to him, we have act, Broadway actress and South Florida local, they're all South Florida locals, Cindy Winters and Darius Daughtry. He is an educator, a director, a poet, and a social activist, and an author. Let's get started. I'm gonna start with Darius. Darius, what does arts equity look like to you? What does arts equity look like to me. Um, it looks like, I, I was just asked that a minute ago um, from Katie with WLRN, uh, and, I, and I thought about church um, and the idea that everyone in that building 
is supposed to be in that space on one accord. You know, we're in there for the same purpose, right? Um, so when I think of equity within the arts arena, it is no matter where you come from, what you look like, what you, you, your experiences are, have been, will be, that there is space for you. My, my granddaddy's a pastor. I think about like, we're, you're all welcome in the house of the Lord, right? So it, the, being able to feel, everyone feeling welcome in the space and feeling like something is there for me. No, well said. And, and you know, Will and Kev grew up in this neighborhood. They grew up a stone's throw from the Broward Center and has come, they come here every year, they tour and fill the audience with their relatives, their family members. But that's the only time they really see them coming here. <laughs> yeah. Kev. You know, Will and I, we went to Dillard High School and it, back in the day, Dillard didn't have a, um, a performing arts center yet. So it was a performing arts school, but we used the Broward Center um, for the first, for all four years that we were there to perform here on this stage, you know? Um, and it was amazing because we would perform, you know, Bach and, Sh and Shostakovich and we would, you know, um, do performances like The Wiz and Grease and play in the pit and run around the halls and just, you know, as, as kids in a brand new facility, it was amazing. It was a huge part of why we are what we are. And my mother, um, my mother would come to all the shows too. And, you know, all of our family would come to the shows at Dillard back in the 90s and, you know, enjoy it. And it was just a really great experience. And, you know, then fast Fast forward 20 years later, and then we, we perform here, I think maybe like 2015, 16, and perform here. And then my mom comes to the show is like, babe, that was so nice. It was such a good show. You know, I haven't been here since high school. And it made me think like, hmm, you know, like we, we grew up here and it's like the community was such a, um, a this theater was such a big part of, of our, of my life and upbringing and, and even my family. And, um, and that kind of saddened me a little bit, you know, to hear that that there wasn't a connection sort of, you know, once we had left. So, you know, for, for us, you know, we're always trying to think about how do we allow the arts and the arts institutions to um, better speak for our community, you know? I mean, we do that as artists all the time. So, you know, I think, you know, for us, we always want to try to push that envelope and see how, you know, um, and this is not just sort of a South Florida thing. This is all around the country. We yeah. perform at theaters all around the country. So, you know, but how to get theaters and the art institutions to connect with the, 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 the community a little bit better. And I think forums like this is sort of the way that we kind of um, start to pot a little bit and, and try to figure out solutions. Yeah, because you and Will have been on these panels across the country. Yes. Will, talk about some ideas that you've seen around the country, ideas that have come forward. Um, yeah, we've, we've had quite a bit of conversations about just kind of like, you know, you know, how does, like you, the first question you asked Darius is like, how do we make this happen? How does, what does equity look like in the theater? And I think um, at the end of the day, the theater as it relates to classical music hasn't always been a safe space, you know what I'm saying? For someone that looks like me, even, even playing the instrument and playing in orchestras, there is always this, this unspoken thing you know what I mean? Like for me, as I got older, I, I kind of figured out what it was, but it was always this energy of just like, all right, I'm gonna go in and rehearse, but you know, this feeling, it goes away when I go home, you know, got, I got my family or whatever, but it's always just like this idea of like not belonging, you know what I mean? And, um, and I think we just gotta fix, we gotta kill that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, at the yeah. end of the day, because if we're trying to connect with the community, we have to create a, a safe space for the community. And, um, and I think ultimately that's that's what I'm hoping that we stir up the pot. I feel like that's what the biggest thing, you know what I mean, is how we get people like like his um his mom, my mom, my auntie, you know, mm -hmm. to to say like, you know what I mean, like this is a space I can come in and watch whatever, you know what I mean? And and yeah. um and I think it comes with just really representation. It comes with from the top to the bottom, just in every single way to to make this this theater and theater around the country mirror the community, you know what I mean? A little bit more than, than it is now, you know? Yeah. If you don't know who Cindy is, Cindy is a Broadway actress. She's been in a little musical called Hamilton, um, Pippin, Motown, just to name a few. You said you traveled across the country and you've gone to churches to try to promote because you were frustrated that the audience didn't reflect your community. Yeah. So I was a part of, um, there's a, there's a, 
long story, but I'm gonna keep it short because we have time. But um, I was a part of a specific team that was cast to be the Motown the Musical promotion team. And I was a part of the marketing leg of Motown the Musical. And usually when we have press events and group sales events, actors from the show take off from the show and then they go out. But because Motown was so new and we were doing HL's Week plus our own publicity on Broadway, there needed to, and they were preparing for a tour, there needed to be a separate group that went out. And I was going out every week, flying out of JFK, uh, out of New York City, um, and going to wherever. And then wherever we went, we met with not only the marketing department of the, uh, the PAC or the, perform the, the center at the time, we also met with an external person who did the um, urban outreach. It's just a really unfortunate way of saying black people and anybody who is not white that we can't access, which is great because we went to places like churches. We went to places where a uh, majority of African American, Caribbean American, Hispanic American, Asian American people were who loved this music, who didn't know that the PAC in their neighborhood, in their area, was bringing this show. And because we have the fortune, the the great fortune of it being Motown music, it's an it's something that people want to listen to, something that people want to participate in, regardless of whether you know their yeah. son or their daughters in the show. So we got to see. I mean. Even in New York, I was still on the promotional team doing events in New York. I would be on the WBLS radio station, mm -hmm. mobile truck, performing a show, a song from the show. And we tried to be at every event we could to reach the people. We would be on NPR stations and jazz stations and all these other uh, secondary, um, secondary mediums mm -hmm. to reach the people. Um, I think... That's, a, that's the generation uh, before me. I'm thinking about my generation and then the generation that comes after me, which is uh, millennials who have Netflix, who have the streaming platforms, who were a part of this, were in a, a gap where I love music and I, was, I know what a CD is and I know what a landline is. Right. <laughs> and now being on the internet all the time and I understand how to Google things and, and, and do things on my phone. So when I was in high school, the Browards in 2005, I was a big theater person. I was in every play at Palmetto Senior High School. Big shout out to Palmetto. Okay. Hello. Out there Real in bye. the stream D land. And I loved The Lion King. I was obsessed with The Lion King. I auditioned for, uh, for states and regions and uh, districts and, and all those uh, performing arts competitions that we went to and as, a, as a Floridian. It's really a privilege. So I went to school also in New York and they didn't really have all of those things uh, for public school, you know? So when I graduated, I knew every song to wait. I knew every word to every song in Wicked. I knew every word and every song in The Lion King. And in 2005, The Lion King came to the Broward Center for the Performing Arts. And I was like, this is my moment. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get a ticket, I'm gonna see the show. So I went on the internet, bam. I looked up The Lion King, bam. I looked at the ticket price, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you lost me. <laughs> you lost me. So I understand now because flash forward, I didn't get a chance to see the show. My parents couldn't afford a, a, a ticket to see that show. I couldn't afford a ticket to see that show, even if I had six jobs working seven days a week. And I did. And I said, you know what? If I can't afford to see my favorite show, I'm not going to come and see anything else. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested. Yeah. And so as an arts lover, you lost me right? I'm not y'all. I just think the system has lost me. And I am one of many, many people that this happens to. Yep. Because once you graduate, you, you have all these things for free. You go to the library in your school, you, you find the soundtrack, you get the, the sheet music, you got it. Boom. Will you sing? Will you, will you play with me? We're going to play this for the school play. Okay, <laughs> cool. It's a talent show. You and me going to do it. Great. When we become adults, then the thing is that 
we don't have that access because monetarily we can't afford it. Right. And in, in New York, on Broadway, they have student rush tickets, and I think there are other programs like that. But, you know, with the Lion King, that's not the case, and, and that might be another conversation for another day. But in that moment and for years to come, I was, I was not in a, a, the place where I could afford a ticket to see a, a Broadway-style show. Mm -hmm. And it hindered, and, I, and, and now, flash forward, you know, from 2005 to 2010, I'm making my debut as Nala in the North American tour of The Lion King and premiering at the Adrian Arts Center. I think about, and I like get chilly willies when I think about this, I'm like, I couldn't afford a ticket to see this show first. Right. Yeah. No, I didn't have goosebumps. access. Yeah, I'm getting goosebumps now. And, and think of how many people get discouraged from that pipeline, right? Like the people that Darius knows, he's a teacher. He knows the other creators, right? Because you're talking about streaming, but TikTok's where it's at. TikTok For all the it. people that, all the kids that are coming up, you know, and they're organically creating all this stuff. What happens when they get to the next level? Who are the people making sure those things are curated and then turn into a streaming series? you know, or then become a play. I mean, how do we keep, and especially when arts education is always an attack. We saw the bright futures. They wanted to only fund STEM students, you know? And I was ready to launch a campaign in Tallahassee about to look, see how many of those legislators had STEM degrees, which I can tell you, probably a lot of them didn't. Yeah. But Darius, talk about arts education and the pipeline of all these students that are excited to create, and then what happens? Yeah, so I think it, and it kind of falls right directly into what Cindy was just talking about, the, the access, right? So for her at that, at that point, she didn't have the access. And so as we talk about equity, it is all about access. And there, there are a myriad of barriers that people, you know, encounter. And so one of them being, you know, financial, one of them being just, you know, um, lack of information, one of them being, the, the idea that they aren't even aware that this is possible. And so, you know, when I was in the public school system, it's just seeing just the fact that the first thing to get cut was always the arts programs, always. Um, and, and so that's for me, like, that's why I even, I, I, be, I started my, I founded my uh, nonprofit organization, Arpa Bills Project, to help I create this more equitable access to the arts to be able to give these young people an opportunity to see that um, that their story is valid, that that this experience that they're having uh, can be a song, can be a poem, can be a painting, can be a play. It can be any of that, and um, you know, and that is important because uh, if we want to continue, if you think about, you know, Kevin Will talking about their parents not not coming here in twenty years. But how do you how do you get somebody to as an adult to to say that oh I love the arts right the way to do that is to impact them when they're a kid right so you have a, a young person you expose that expose that young person to these to classical music to theater right for me I was exposed to poetry at an, at like eight years old you know and in the theater at like ten or twelve right so when you give that them give, give them these opportunities to see that. Now they may, 20 years from now, may never become an artist, right? But now they have an appreciation for it. And now they're like, they're the ones that are gonna be like, hey, Broward Center, what y'all got coming here for me, for me to see, for me to take part of, right? So it is important that we invest and directly invest in, in our young people to make sure that they have these opportunities, yeah. you know? And then on the flip side, make sure that there is something in the building for the young people who become adults to want to come in and partake in and be a part yeah. of. So many of our, our, our of us are told you're going to be a starving artist. Even Cicely Tyson's mother, the late Cicely Tyson, great Cicely Tyson was told, her mama was like, you are not going to make any money being an actress. That's not true. You guys aren't starving. I know Will and Kevin are not starving. My, my mom told me the same thing. I remember, <laughs> I remember when, um, when I was in high school and she, um, and, and you know, I've been playing violin all these years. She'd been taking me to all of these classes 
And then I got a full scholarship to go to FIU. And I tell her, I'm like, Ma, so I got a full scholarship to FIU. They're going to pay for everything. They're going to actually pay me to go to school, you know, and I'm going to major. And she was like, oh, that's great. She was so excited. I was like, yeah, so, you know, I said I was going to be a doctor, but I think I'm going to major in music. She's like, how are you going to make money, though? Like, right. you know, she got so scared for me as, a, as my safety as an artist, you know, because she was just sort of afraid, I guess, of what that next step is. She didn't really want me to be a starving artist. And I think that was sort of kind of um, because she didn't see how someone like us could, you know, transcend and go somewhere and, 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 and turn into this, you know, and I think all of the three points that, you know, that, that you guys make as far as accessibility to the tickets, I think the educating the, the audience is a big part of it, you know, as well. And I think that, you know, all of those things are so important to try to kind of bridge the gap as we're here trying to right, discuss. Because somebody's you know? making money. Somebody's making money. But there is a <laughs> there is a kind of a, a gap between sort of like what we're saying, like as a kid and you know, you're you're there and then and then you try to buy the ticket and you could it and then you make it kind of, you know, so to speak. And it's like, what do we do in the middle? You know? And I think that's the gap we're trying to bridge. You know, it, it starts with you know, educating the kids so that they see representation of us, you know, they see you as Nala, they see two black guys playing violin, they see, you know, you not only, not only just um, Darius as a playwright, but you put on the entire production and, you know, they, and, you know, even for me, that was inspiring seeing the show that um, you put on this summer. So I, I think that's a really important part of it as well. All of those components together, we need to kind of work on it, you know, as a community and also as, as the art, artistic institutions and in all of these um, communities as well. Yeah, I know Sydney wants to weigh in on this. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, this is all good, and that's good, that's great, I love it. Um, we talk about, so there is a gap, right? And now, as a young person, I'm young, y'all, okay? So, don't get it twisted. Um, as a young person, you not only have to think about the arts and be passionate about that, and focus and go to classes and study and shed and, and practice and stuff. You now have to be the producer. You have to create the budget. You have to talk about the scene. You have to talk about marketing. You have to talk about all these things, where you believe your show was going to go because I didn't get here based on my, just my talent. I had to figure out my lane. Your business. I had to figure out my business model. I wasn't going to take every job. I wasn't going to play an audition for to be the stripper in a, a, a NCIS, dead stripper number two. I wasn't going to be that. <laughs> I had a vision for myself and for my community and how I wanted my, my, my community to see me and also how I wanted the person that was going to come up after me to walk that path like the others before me. And so I had to be very clear on my vision as far as marketability. Yeah. and who I was going to play. Now, granted, let's not forget or realize, I'm a light-skinned woman of color. I'm Chinese Jamaican. Shout out to my Chinese Jamaicans hey. in the world, okay? And I know when I step out of my house, I'm going to be seen, heard, and experienced as a black woman in America, period. Okay, great. So I understand that there are going to be roles that I'm going to be playing or messages that are going to be put brought my way i have to discern what's that, what that's going to be to be palpable for an audience i have spent the 16 years of my profession doing that and then performing yeah so when we talk about access or when starving artists yes there's a lot of things that have to go into creating what the audience just sees especially now we think because of shows like the competition shows we see on television that it just happens like that you could be you're so talented you should audition for american idol i did american idol the voice america's got talent which else i'm making the band i'm auditioning for all of them they all rejected me wow. so understanding that it's not just that there are how many pacs in the united states of america somebody somebody help me uh, hundreds, no, hundreds. Yeah, I go to these conferences. Yep. Hundreds. <laughs> you all need people to come and be performers in this. You need content, right? You need programming. So for people like us, for our parents, thank you. And for your young person's parent, like if you are an audience member right now, you have a young person who wants to go into the arts, listen, there is a space for them because venues 
need people and need performers and need performances. And they also need audiences. And with however many million people there are in the United States, we can still try to get those people if there's a bigger sort of uh, representation of what the world, what our world looks like. Yeah, but it's a good thing you didn't get into any of those shows because they own you. That too. They own I you. I had to sign, and this was the first audition, I had to yeah. sign a docu documents this thing. Yeah, yeah, you, they own you. Mm -hmm. I mean, Will and Gab, you talk about that ownership. Oh, I mean, yeah. You guys run your own entity. I mean, how did you, you know, I mean, you hear so many stories of broke artists, you know, they got two or three hits and then right. whoop, poof, where do they go? Just got to educate yourself. And I think, um, I mean, <laughs> I think a lot of times too, you're, you're going to get hit. It's, it's going to happen at some, at some point. Right. But I think um, the, the key of that is learning from that. You know what I mean? And as an artist, man, you got to know who you are. First and foremost, you got to know where your standards are. You know what I mean? Someone comes up with a situation and a deal. The funny thing is we, we were called to do America's, America's got talent. Like, like seven times. I think it was 10 times and they still call, even though we do this, it's crazy. Yeah, like <laughs> a lot of times. And every time, every time they call, I'm, I'm really like the only one that's like, I don't know about this, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I mean? They last show, they had like a, a, a talking cow or whatever. I don't know. This, this I think it's the mass like, singer. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So and we already did Apollo. We won that. So and for me, it was just like, it was the integrity of the show. It just wasn't really what we were about. You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, man, a million people are going to see you or whatever. And it's like, yeah. I don't really care about that. It's like, they're going to see me and they're going to see this talking cow, you know? Yeah. I mean, and I do like they it. really see you? That's the whole <laughs> thing. They're Eat not really chicken, they don't <laughs> You know, but they you guys, for the talking cow. but you, part of your business model is creating your own content. I mean, it'd be on content creation day. Yeah. Talk about the bridge from, you know, where you're sitting. You're not those guys on the Apollo. You haven't been those guys for like 20 years, but now you're trying to reach back to the next generation and communicate with them and empower some of the artists you showcase. Yeah, try to, you know, try to let them understand that it's not just about, it, it's a, you gotta, it encompasses a lot of different things, you know what I mean? And you gotta educate yourself, not only with the business, not only with understanding what publishing is and, and what all these different things are, because these things are important and ownership is, is crucial, you know what I'm saying? You gotta understand, listen, this is your art, this is something that you created, you should own that, you know what I mean? And all these different things is some things that we learned along the way that honestly, you know, we were presented with different books in here and there, but you have to, you have to educate yourself. You got to know it, you know, and, and, um, and it came with experience. We've been doing this for a long time, you know, 20 plus years. So it's, so, um, you know, we try to educate the younger generations coming up. And I think one of the, one of the key things is just understanding that you're worthy. And, and when, what I mean by that is, when someone comes up to you and tries to present you a deal, if you know who you are and you know what you represent, then if you, if you, then you can see the the situation or the contract for what it is, you know. And um, I think that's one of the one of the major things because a lot of times they see you and they like what you do and they like, hey, here's here's some money. Once you sign sign a dotted line, you know what I mean? And, and next thing you know, you're, you know, <laughs> you're coming home and, and you're still living in the same place as you're living and you're selling records. So you know, it's just educating and understanding, you know, who you are, understanding your worth, you know? Yeah, but there's so much that can waver you off that foundation if you're not, yeah. if you're not. Yeah. Now, Darius, you are a producer, writer, director, um, you know, talk about what that journey is like as you create. And I mean, here at the Broward Center, you've, you've been showcased, you know, but it's not every performing arts center you see in the country that, you know, you have where playwrights get a stage or, or get that kind of support yeah um you're right and it's 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 a blessing um and i want to share a quote hold on a second let me open this up i wanted to make sure i actually got this right no, absolutely. all right hold on. all right so this is uh my fit my well marvin gay is my favorite artist of all time but secondly my favorite thinker is james baldwin so this is a James Baldwin quote, uh, and he says, the war of an artist with his society is a lover's war, and he does, as he must, what lovers do, which is to reveal to, to the beloved, to himself, and with that revelation, to make freedom real. And so he was talking about 
at that time, like, um, and specifically being like a black artist in America and the idea of holding up a mirror because, because you love the country, if you treat the society as a beloved, as a lover, and what you do to, your, to the lover is you reveal like, hey, this is what's happening. I mean, so the lover can see the things that, that are wrong, that, they need, that we need to work on, that, that where we need to go um, in order for there to be freedom, in order for there to be a free relationship, freedom in the relationship. So I, for me, you'd ask about uh, me producing and, and creating work and then working with uh, the Broward Center. I think about that. I think about um, the work that I do is centered in that revelation. It is centered in being unabashedly honest about things that may make others uncomfortable. And the fact that um, work like that oftentimes is either shunned, you know, in spaces, or it is... Um, Buried? No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it is like plucked and said, okay, here, here it is. We've done it. We've done one. Oh. So y'all good now? Right. Y'all good now, right? We, we here, here's this thing. We right. did we did we did slave play. So so we yeah. did that. So we we good now, right? We can go back to the to to uh, you know doing um guys and dolls, right? Yeah, it's like so February is over. Book. February is over. We're right. In March. We, we right. Done, we're, exactly. We've done we've done we've done what we had to do in February. Right. Exactly. So right. um you know being able to do we just did a love like this was which is an original here last month and at it was amazing, but a lot of the people that were there had never been here, right? People that live right around, right around the corner had never been here, but it, it was because there was something here that they like, oh, that's, oh, that's for me? Like yeah. something is there for, for me, because it was a show that centered, centered black love. And, you know, it's interesting, this is full transparency. So we partnered, my organization partnered with a, uh, a white led theater company real talk like i mean that's amazing right that's access so then now the next the next step is i don't, I don't need them as a partner right because I, I i can i can just be here right that's the next step yeah. is it i don't know right that's that's and, and that's and that's what we're working towards and, and yeah we've been talking about it so hopefully that happens um and so again that's access but the fact that we, when we were talking about doing a show here they were like, well, what, what are we going to do? And they presented doing a show that felt traumatic. It felt, it, it dealt in the space of, of black trauma. And I'm like, nah, we ain't doing that. We ain't doing that. That's, um, that seems to be where we always go. And, and in spaces, and in spaces where we aren't the majority or we aren't really considered as, as much, that's often what is, I mean, how many times can we see a raisin in the sun? Right. Love it. I love everything in the sun. You know, that got me into theater. But I mean, that's not our it's, only it's story. 2021. And there's so many, so many things yeah. that even, you know, from the 70s, 60s, 50s that we haven't covered and up until now. But there's so many other things. So, you know, so we wanted to center on something that, that felt like black love and black joy and a diversity, a humanity that exists in, in black folk. Yeah, Kev, give me one second. I just want to remind the audience and everyone watching on Zoom, this is your discussion as well. We look forward and welcome your questions. You know, just to add to that, you know, I I came with my wife and saw that show. Um, you know, Jan you know, sent me the uh, the invite and um, and I saw it and I was like, "Baby, we going." And then I went and I kind of had an experience, sort of like my mother. Like I haven't sat in the Broward Center and watched a show. And I thought about it while I was there, and I was like, "Wow!" And it was so good. I mean, amazing show. Um, and it was just, you know, uh, you know, Broward front to back, all of it. You know, even the music, everything felt like like it was like part of me or part of us, you know? And it was really, really beautiful to see. And, um, and I really just had to jump in and say, like, I applauded you for, for the work on that. And it was a, a beautiful story of black love. It wasn't traumatic. I left feeling like, you know, I mean, just inspired, you know, by the stories that you told and how bold and fearless you were with your, your storytelling. So um, just wanted to throw Much on appreciate a, it. Much a, appreciate a, a thing. Yes, you. No. It is, it'll be streamed soon. So y'all make sure to check it yes, out. Yes, I was just about to say, it's going to be available for all soon. We'll let you know when. Uh, for Cindy, online question. 
Hamilton is largely famous for its colorblind casting. Is this the exception on Broadway or are there more opportunities now for black actors on Broadway? And more importantly, I guess, black creators or creators of color? There's an entire movement going on right now uh, and, uh, and I, it's like a reconstruction of Broadway and a lot of conversations that are being had, particularly during the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and the, the assassination of George, George Floyd. Um, there was a hashtag that was very clear and plain that says Broadway is racist. And yeah, sure. Here's a thought that I had and chime in. I want to know how you guys feel. What, when, I, when you call something racist, right? people take offense to it, especially if you're like, you're being, you're acting like you're, you're being racist. You're like, ah, oh, I'm not racist. But look around you, your environment, your status. It's not that you are a racist. It's that your race is elitist. And you, there is a, a separation of uh, relatability. Right. What does what happens to you doesn't happen to me. And so I can't relate. Right. But with Broadway. It started at vaudeville and all of these sort of these vignettes of entertainment. Came at the expense of black people from the beginning. So how do you and, and Broadway is run by. Gatekeepers. Yes. Right. And none of them are black. None of them are non-white. So to say that Broadway is racist, it's, ju it's, it's just, like, am I gonna get blast blacklisted for saying this? It's just like, these families are the, the gatekeepers and if we like this show, we're gonna do it. If we don't like the show, or if it doesn't fit for what we're doing, maybe not. Yeah. And or it's a token show. There, and, and based on black trauma, which we don't want to talk about because there's more joy in it, more joy in our lives. I do, I have created a show about Lena Horne and I, I wanted to tell this woman's story not because I love jazz and I love jazz vocalists. I wanted to tell her story because she's a multifaceted human being that's still relevant as I am today, as Beyonce is today. She's fighting for this, she fought for the same things Beyonce fights for today. And it started somewhere. Beyonce got her inspiration from somebody, got her inspiration from somebody, got their inspiration from Lena Horne. And is there a bird in here? Yeah. So with the, the, the things that Lena stood for uh, in her civil rights activism are the very same things that we talk about today. But peppered in all of that is joy. Yeah, peppered in all of that is love. Pepin and all of that is um, a turn of a way, you know, how we exercise our freedoms. Yep. And when you would see Lena Horne, you would see her as this fair skinned, straight nosed, beautiful woman with a powerful voice. And she's, you know, she can be on the, the Perry Como show and, and you know, Frank Sinatra show and whatever. And then when she goes home, she talks like you and me, she gets down, she has a martini, you know, she's hanging out. And she could only be like that in her environment. But imagine if we had full, we had the freedom to do that. Yeah. In all spaces, particularly art, where art is the most uh, effective way to influence people. Yep. You jingle, you sing a little song, it's catchy, you got it. What are we saying? How are we saying? And now how many of you guys have all seen Hamilton or heard the soundtrack? Yeah. Probably everybody. How did you hear about it? Did you hear about it from a friend? Shout it out. Friend. Um, what did your friend say to get you to listen to the soundtrack or watch the show? <laughs> Go see it. It's rapping in it. You're going to enjoy it. Anybody else? Is it a first cast? I only heard from the black people. White people, please help me. Because I know y'all done heard the soundtrack. See it? It's going to be on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> um, why do we why do we need Hamilton to come to our our performing arts center? Money, money is going to make money. Right. Okay. No one just talked about the music is good. Yeah. The content is good. But it's good. It's really good. The 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 topic of what we're talking about is an American story. 
It is colorblind casting because that's the way America looks. It could be anybody. He's from the Caribbean. Boop. Very excited about that. <laughs> it's Caribbean Heritage Month. It's Caribbean. Oh, yeah. And if you liked Hamilton in the slightest bit, you better go to your nearest black friend and say, thank you for bringing that music to me because I'm not throwing away my shot. <laughs> I am not. If you are singing that in your head, you got to thank somebody black. You got to thank somebody black because that music wouldn't have come to you otherwise, right? It wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have access to that. But I'm so thankful that when I started in, in theater, I wasn't, I'm a singer songwriter. My, my inspirations are Bob Marley, Lauren Hill. It's not Stephen Sondheim, sorry. Although he's got mad words. I, he's basically rapped his entire career. He's got bars. But I was inspired by those people. So when Hamilton and In the Heights came along, I was like, this is, these are my people. Mm -hmm. They had the access, Kevin McCollum and Jeffrey Sellers. What's up, y'all? gave Lin-Manuel Miranda and his team the opportunity to bring it to a broader stage. Right. Thank goodness for our white allies, yep. because without you, we wouldn't be here. And it's great. And so with the idea of colorblind casting, I don't want to talk about colorblind casting. I want to talk about just opening the door for people on stage and behind the stage. Yep. Because it's people like you and people like you and people like you who go, I like that a lot. And because I like it, let's, let's give it a shot. We can't succeed otherwise. Yeah. We cannot succeed otherwise. Because gatekeepers are, don't look like us. Yeah. But talk about as black artists, you, know, you talk about Lena Horne, we can go back to Harry Belafonte and Ruby Dee and Ozzie Davis and Sidney Poitier. You can't just go on the stage and perform. At some point in time, what's going on around you affects you. 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Will yeah. is like, yes. Yeah, yeah. Will, I hear yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, like you said earlier, um, Darius, about, you know, the, the, um, the quote that you mentioned about being a mirror. You know, I think that's, and that's the thing that I, that I love about artists that I love. Like one of my favorite artists, Curtis Mayfield. And, you know, I love his music because it's not, it makes you move, it makes you groove. But at the same time, he was a mirror. He was like a, <laughs> you, you cannot listen to his music and not know what's happening, you know? And I think as artists, you know, you know I don't think every, I'm not going to put that responsibility on every single artist. Not every artist is going to really take that mantle and be like, you know what, I'm going to be the mirror and show the world what it is and what it, you know, what it represents because that's what, you know, artists, the easiest way, the best way to really reach and communicate to people. And, and I think um, look, with everything going on, going around, I mean, I just can't, I can't just not say anything. I can't just be who I am. You know, I'm at the end of the day, I'm a person first. I'm a black man first. So, you know, I'm a family man. I have kids. I have a wife. Shouts out to my wife sitting there. He's smart, man. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I got to talk about it, you know, and I got to be fearless about it. And I think because of hip hop, I think a lot of reasons why I am the way that I am, the, the fearless, the, the idea of, listen, I'm just going to do me, you know, that came with hip hop, not classical, you know, and I had to be that way to feel like I could just walk in these arenas and be all right. You know what I mean? And um, so so yeah, we got to be the mirror. We got to, we got to do it because it's necessary, especially now, especially the kids that are growing up, they got to see us and be like, that's cool. <laughs> you know, it's cool yes. to play that violin. It's cool to be in the back and just write and, and, and be creative and, and, and do awesome things, you know? Yeah. And what are we going to do this weekend? Are we going to go to the mall? Or are we going to go to the Barton? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, yes. and exactly. And you know what's interesting? Like, you know, I got to give this brother some flowers too, because he always, um, he's sort of our integrity line of Black Violin. Like he's like, I'll be like, remember, I remember 10 years ago, America's Got Talent would hit us and I'd be like, maybe we should do it. There's a couple of million people that he's like, man, they're going to try to change this or something else. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know, you're right. You know, like he'd always keep the integrity. But because of that, I feel like, you know, we're artists that completely 100% ourselves on stage and do whatever we want. And we're unapologetic. And we have a message about, you know, breaking stereotypes, thinking differently. And a black man could do anything that you didn't think they could do. And we do that every night and get paid to do it all around the country and be unapologetic. Now, the, 
<laughs> the road was long, <laughs> you know, to get there. And I think we had to break barriers in every town that we went to to do this. But it is possible to be 100% yourself in, in, in an art form that um, could have been here for hundreds of years that you can truly put your culture into it and change it and change how institutions look at you where they they can't you know like with hamilton like you gotta book hamilton like you know it you have to now like they they change the they change the um the perception of it and they made it something that has to be accepted and i think with black violin we're kind of doing that too um it might take a little longer but i think these type of breakthroughs are what will provide the representation for young young audiences to come. Yeah, I, and that's sort of the hope that we're trying to do. And it's a big part of our mission. I'm sure everyone's mission on this stage, um, even yours, you know, to yeah. you know, always be pushing that forward and showing, you know, the younger kids, you know, you could do it exactly how you want yeah. and still win yeah. if you do it. And you're, 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 you have integrity and authenticity in what you're trying to do. And sometimes you have a calling and sometimes you are called. And I think in this moment, many of us were called. Darius? Yeah, if I can just jump in real quick. So as Kevin, we were just talking about being authentic and fearless, and Will was talking about hip hop. And I just kind of want to make this point. Um, there is, so one of my favorite hip hop groups is NWA, right? And they are super, when they came out, super controversial, right? But why? Because they were holding the mirror up. They were reporting. They were being Gordon Parks of their generation, just showing what is happening. And then when these things are called out, there was all this pushback. They got, you know, uh, police officers wouldn't uh, come and cover their, uh, their concerts. They got arrested for performing uh, songs and, you know, and all of this because they were speaking in a manner that made people uncomfortable. And hearing that coming from them, from people who that they felt uh, didn't have enough cachet, enough power to be speaking in that manner made people uncomfortable. And so I think, you know, uh, when we talk about being authentic and, and being that, and everybody, Black people are not a monolith, right? And so the, their, that on, authenticity is going to come out differently depending upon who you are, right? So, you know, but you mentioned like Lena Horn is like, you know, what is that, that forward facing, you know, image that we have to present sometimes. And so that sometimes as black artists, we feel we have to, you know, speak a certain way, we have to say it and try to code it, code the language in a manner that is going to be acceptable and palatable. Yeah, right. And inclusive and inclusive. But sometimes you just got to keep it real. Yeah. 100, 1000, tell it like it is. You, if you are uncomfortable, you need to ask yourself, why are you uncomfortable with what you just experienced? And if you can't do that in the arts, where can you? Absolutely. Where can you? Um, we, the audience has taken over the moderating now, guys. Since one of Darius's favorite artists is Marvin Gaye and Cindy appeared in Motown the Musical, framing this question in the Motown milieu, paraphrasing Barry Gordy's philosophy, it matters because it made money. Could everyone chime in on how important it is to spotlight the black experience that has to have, they have to be a blockbuster in order to bridge the gap. I mean, what's the challenge there? I mean, you guys go, you, you said you had to make sure you toured and did PR and- Yeah, so this is actually really, in, in, I'm trying to frame my response with what this means um, and how this can make sense and be relevant for the question. Um, it doesn't need to be a blockbuster. It helps because it employs over 50 people of color, black people on a stage at one time uh, around the country and around the world in several different companies. So that's great. It also allows access to people to come to a performing arts center that would not otherwise have access. It's a barrier of entry, right? If we get the blockbuster in here, great. Then we could bring grandma, auntie, and cousins, and little baby, and come through and watch this thing. And this is a part of our history because Motown is not only just a blockbuster because of the music. It's a part of our culture. It's part of American. It's woven into the fabric of America at this point, you know. And everyone can enjoy it. In fact, Motown was the music, was the thing that desegregated dance halls. So, 
it's important and, and everyone can see the relevance of it, even if it's as, as uh, trivial as I love the music, it was doing something bigger. Now, um, going along that line, once Motown leaves, you now have a window of opportunity to go, all audiences matter. Yep. And not only having colorblind casting on stage, having colorblind marketing and going, all right, join us for the next one where we have another sort of event that will include your community, that we can all kind of have a, a discourse on when, when we get back into the seats. What's going to bring you back to the Broward Center of Performing Arts? Okay, let's have another show that can bring people that feeling again. Yeah, and like this person read your mind because they're like, what about the history of the theater and the whiteness of the administrators and the people that receive these shows? They, this uh, panel, this uh, viewer would love to hear the panel's, panelists' thoughts about the importance of access and Black representation in arts administration, production, and programming. If I, if I could jump in real quick. So, you know, connecting that to the previous question, right? Um, in the green room, you all were having a conversation and you all mentioned the opportunity to fail, right? And how, and how that is a privilege. Yes. having to, to be able to fail um we all know like in theater right like oftentimes that's it's not a everything isn't a, isn't a hamilton right so a, a lot of a lot of shows end up not making money right but does that mean that that particular director that particular writer do, doesn't get work again nah but you know because there aren't people in key positions there aren't people who are gatekeepers who are going to give more opportunities, even if something isn't a blockbuster, because they see the value in the work, right? And that's why it, it so, yo, oh, man, you, oh, nobody came. So nah, I guess we. Uh, I guess that was it for you and everybody know. else behind and, you. And then, right, that's exactly. <laughs> so not just for you, because you mentioned about like opening the door, right? So then if it isn't a blockbuster, if it doesn't, doesn't you know, do super well, then it's like, well, again, back to what we, what we tried. We, you know, we tried our black play, you know, um, and again, yeah, no more, I guess that's it. Right. You know, so it is important that, you know, when we talk about grooming artists from, from a young age and thinking about the idea that it, everything isn't just about being on the stage and like, how do you groom those people to be, to be those uh, in those boardrooms as, as administrators, as artistic directors, you know, executive directors of, of PACs, how do you do that? And that, that's, that's super important. Yeah, and can I add to yes. that too? I was watching ESPN this morning. I promise this will make sense in a second. But I was watching <laughs> ESPN this morning and they were talking about um, a coach, uh, white coach for Boston, uh, Brad Stevens got fired, but then he got promoted to the front office. So he got fired and then got promoted <laughs> upstairs kind of thing. Um, and then there's a whole breakout, you know, between the, the black uh, pl um, analysts and the white analysts. And then they talked about in the sport of basketball, we've all seen basketball where it's 70% black, there are two, two um, black presidents of operation. So like two out of 32 teams, two black people make that last decision. And probably, you know, second black sport, I would say in America, right? You know, so this is a more of a systemic problem. Like we all know, you know, this is something in the art community. It's in the sports community. It's in the business, news community. The news community you could speak to, you know, so it's something that is so much deeper than, than all of Diversity this. Diversity is not window dressing. Yeah. It's <laughs> just exactly. not window dressing. So it's one of those things is like, we're all, we're talking about this. This could be a panel about anything. And I think we all will have these same problems. Like the gatekeepers, you know, um, don't look like us, you know? And it's all it is is us kind of chipping through and like, you know, and, and for every one of us, you know, they hopefully one of us becomes a, an executive and then, you know, time will, yeah. will tell. I mean, but that that's something that I think yeah. that is a And a now problem arts programs country. are talking about putting um, internships and fellowships and because we all talk about this. We couldn't afford to work for free when we left college. Right. Please. Because we couldn't. I couldn't do news. I had a paid uh, reporter trainee program at the CBS affiliate in Washington. Yeah. It was fourteen thousand dollars. I was still cleaning houses on the on the weekends, but <laughs> it's we me think ways. about we think about things like you know we graduate from because our parents are immigrants, yeah. you know, or we come from black families, and when we graduate high school, we have to get a job, or 
we're exceptional, we get a fellowship, but we still want to need a little pocket money so then we get a job. And the reason why is because a lot of us have to help pay our families, pay, help out at home. So, you know, I'm working at six different dance studios seven days a week, and then also working at the club at night and, and working in the concession stand and doing all these different things. I worked everywhere in Miami. I did everything. <laughs> just so I can help pay the light bill or help pay part of the mortgage or help, you know, supplement things that my peers didn't have to do. They just went to school and failed. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I didn't have the space to do that. I didn't have the flexibility to fail. Everything was, had, was the stakes were high. And I have a friend who is a writer and she, she just, she's been writing for a, a television show on a streaming, a very a famous TV show on a streaming platform. And she got this really great deal. And some friends of hers through these events that they would typically charge people. We were talking about this in the back room. And they looked at her and said, and they were a, a white couple. They said, girl, you know, we let you free in the last couple of times, but you can, you can pay this time because you got that, you know, you got that good Hollywood money. And another friend who was white said, wait a minute, what you don't understand is she might've gotten that contract and it might've had a couple of commas on it and a couple of zeros on it, but she has a Nigerian mother that she has to help support. And that's not uncommon for our community. Nope. So when it comes to accept, when it comes to like equity and in, in wage, thinking about that, oh, you're a woman, you don't necessarily need to get paid as much as a man, blah, 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 or you're a person of color, whatever. We are still supporting our families. In, in the news business, when they get a job in Florida, people go, oh, they don't pay much because they pay you in sunshine. I said, in case you didn't notice, I don't need sunshine. <laughs> I am sunshine. Um, how, <laughs> this other question says, how might we encourage a wealth fund or investment fund specifically to support the arts? Because we know if you got money, you can fail. But Will, I mean, you wanted to add to the, the last, the last uh, topic? Well, uh, I mean, there's just a lot going on. <laughs> a lot of conversations. It's getting but... hot in here? Real high. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I wanted to comment really quickly on the, the last the last thing. I think ultimately, you know, what we're talking about is paid internship. Like we can't, it's just, it's just not feasible for, for to ask someone to, to work here and, 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 you know, be an intern and really not get paid because there's responsibility that person has. And, and I think we, and, and the gatekeepers, if, if you have to be willing and the ones that are there, they have to be willing to just like, okay, this person, is here in this position. If you see potential in this person, give that person a chance, groom that person to become one day that person that's one of the gatekeepers. And I think that's what it boils down to, you know what I mean? Period. You have to say, okay, listen, I've been on top for how long? 40 years, everyone on this platform looks like me. You know what I mean? If you really, really, understand how if you really believe that we need equity this is what needs to happen you need to really you know make way you know what i'm saying and um it's not going to happen if they're not willing to because it can it can stay the same you know what i'm saying they can keep it the same and um what was the other question what are you talking about? What was that? <laughs> it talked about how do we encourage a wealth fund or investment fund specifically to support the arts because when i first heard cindy's story about not being able to afford a ticket i mean i I'm, i come to a lot of shows i'm fortunate you see empty seats do arts programs then say, hey, season ticket holders, if you're not gonna come, let us know. We'll give it to a bunch of students. We'll let students know, just like Hamilton does $10 tickets, you know, let them come fill the seat, seat fillers. I mean, it just needs to be a collaborative effort, man. Um, and I think the, the ones with the long, <laughs> the big pockets, <sighs> let me just talk about how amazing art is. You know what I mean? I remember we took a trip to New York and uh, this is my first time going to New York, I'm like, you know, do I need a jacket? I got a jacket, went there, I'm like, I need three jackets. It was just freezing. And I remember it was just such an amazing experience when we went to, we saw Smokey Joe's Cafe. Oh, yeah, we were in high and school, just, we were in 10th grade in high school. Yeah, we saw Smokey Joe's Cafe. What was the other one? We saw Rent. Might have seen Rent. rent. 
first year was out, and it wasn't. It wasn't. We saw rent. It wasn't even popping, popping yet. But yeah, like, it was I, like in the beginning of stages. And I remember we saw rent, and our teacher was like, uh, "Maybe we shouldn't have brought him them here. That's tenth grade." <laughs> I remember right. that. And then Smokey Joe's was dope. So yeah. Smokey Joe's was amazing. It just blew me away. I mean, I just remember just thinking to myself, "This is amazing." And for like maybe six months, I started, I couldn't stop dreaming. You know what I'm saying? I just couldn't stop like thinking like, man, that's what I want. I want to do that. You know what I mean? That's what the art does. It just makes us, it, it brings us, it brings the best out of us. It makes us alive. You know what I mean? And it's just like, especially kids that are in this community that are going through so much, they need that thing that's just going to make them feel like man you belong you're good you know what i'm saying you you are worthy you know what i'm saying that's what the arts does so if you're a person with some deep pockets <laughs> just understand how and it and it doesn't necessarily mean that that person that kid is gonna end up becoming the next whoever you know what i mean but it will i promise you it will affect that person in a, in a positive way you know like everyone that, that went to school with us in high school, um, they, they praise our teacher for, you know what I'm saying, for all the things that he's done, even though they don't do music, they're, you know, accountants or whatever, you know? Shout out to the arts teachers. Yeah, Shout, yeah. Out, yeah. To Shout arts out to teachers. the arts oh, teachers man. who do it for love. Can I add yes. to this? Okay, so to our friends with, with the, the wealth, uh, deep pockets, whatever you'd like to be called. The trust like, funds. Trust funds, you let us meet, let me know how you feel comfortable being called um <laughs> there we all know how arts are funded okay it, it sort of trickles down and then the artists the quote the common term the starving artists yeah. you know i dis I, I have such disdain for that term because um i like to eat too and there's no reason why i should shouldn't be able to eat as much as the finance guy because he's bad as hell and he sits <laughs> at his desk and he crunches numbers and then I'm like sweating and trying to run all around the city to audition for this 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 thing and try to create a show and try to write and do, get myself marketed and all this other stuff I the least that you can do because let me entertain you for a second I don't mind working and so we market the arts as this great thing with passion and that's what a lot of folks in the regular world, the muggles, sorry, <laughs> you, some of them lack passion. We are so fortunate to be people who saw Smokey Joe's Cafe, heard uh, Bach and Beethoven, and went, oh, I'm alive, something happened to me, and I'm gonna spend the rest of my life going toward that, that feeling. And then they sell it to you at a cheap price. Yeah. And then you get a little bit of it, you go, oh, and then they'll sell it to you again for a cheap And price. then one day you buy another student a ticket. And then you, <laughs> you know? And so then you, you finally get to a position where you can, oh, praises be, that someone sees you and goes, okay, you've done this, you've broken through the fourth wall, you've actually impacted and made an impact, and now you can leave the door open and we can continue to do this. For people my age or people who are younger than me, who have all these other options to not, especially after, COVID and after being inside all the time and figuring out what to do, we want to still value the art form itself, live performance. We want to still value those things because it doesn't take away, it, it, it will never replace the human experience, like the human yep. experience. Yep. And if nothing has, if COVID, this whole time has taught you nothing besides we need each other, we need people and we need to feel good and feel entertained. And the whole roaring twenties happened because we were all locked inside. Let's continue that. And let's always teach our young ones that these, these things are important, just as important as TikTok, yep. just as important. Yep, no, absolutely. And just to, um, to that question, if, if you are those people with long paper, you know, deep pockets, uh, look for community foundations and stuff in, in your city, in your community, like, like the Community Foundation of Broward, like Miami Foundation, you know, like the Night Arts, like, like look for, for places where you can uh, support and invest. Um, I know um, uh, Philip Dunlap, the uh, director of the Culture Division of Broward County is here, and I know they, they recently put out a whole, um, economic impact report 
does this show how much impact the arts has on like the area? I don't know what that number was. I don't know if Phil has a number in his head. You want to yell it out? Right, right. So like the economic impact, thank you, sir, was like $414 million, right? So it's like, you know, when you think about supporting the arts, it isn't just, oh, okay, we're giving some money to some artists who don't really want to work, right? Mm -hmm. it, like, what is the residual and long-term and outward, outward expanding effect? Yeah. You, you can't be a real city without an arts community. Absolutely. You just can't. This, this ties right into the next question. The, um, the viewers sit talking about the city, talking about reaching millennials. Does the panel have any innovative ideas on how to encourage millennials and Gen Zers to come see performing arts in a live performance rather than sitting at home on TikTok um, or watching streaming? Um, well, for us, you know, we, we, we kind of forced them to come because when we get back on the road, which is, um, looks like it's going to be pretty soon, um, <laughs> you know, we perform for kids, um, you know, right here in the theater, you know, and, you know, so it's a mission of ours that we almost kind of force the, the, the cities to do it. Um, we're going to, you know, we don't have to force here because we kind of grew up here and we're doing it here. Uh, it's, uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah. Thanksgiving weekend. The kids show is the Monday after Thanksgiving. So packed house, thousands of kids. So that's how we do it, you know, um, is that we try to play a kid's show in the morning and then do a little workshop with the kids in the middle of the day, play a public show that night and bring them on our stage so that they're feeling the roar of the, the crowd. They're part of what, what's happening and just kind of planting seeds. So, you know, that's kind of what we do just sort of on a, on a, on a black violin level. But in general, I think that's what theaters should be, you know, focusing on is just finding ways to educate their audiences. But also telling your story. We did a program with uh, schools around the country telling their story yeah. and letting them know that if you're a kid sitting down thinking of classical music, you are not alone. Yeah, I mean, and then it's not even just about thinking about classical music. It is about what anyone is capable of, you know? Like, I, I, we don't go on stage telling people to be violin players. Violin's hard, you know? It's a difficult <laughs> instrument to play. We happen to play it. We fell in love with it. We turned it into what we turned it into. But we tell everyone to just chase that thing. When you wake up in the morning and you just want to, you know, watch anime or play video games or skateboard, or you want to write or, you know, think about science, whatever, you, you're already in what your passion is. Just focus on that passion, you know, throw as many hours at that passion as possible. And that's, that's our message. So we say that message every time we get on stage. It's not really just about art or music. It's about passion, that thing you just, that, that burning desire in you, whatever that is, focus on that, spend 10,000 hours doing it. And someday somebody's going to pay you yeah. to do it. And you know? we had a lot of time to sit and think during the pandemic. Yeah, we did. Um, how do South Florida's black audiences learn or hear about performances? Now we've talked about this, about going to the community in the same way that you did with Motown. Is it Facebook groups? Is it emails? Is it word of mouth? How can we address the barrier of awareness? That's a good, that's a good question. Can I just piggyback on, yes. on, on uh, Kev's point, just oh, this last question? Because um, I'm a millennial. <laughs> I'm at the very end, uh, you know, I'm like at the, I'm an old millennial, but um, I see the, the impact that TikTok has and I, and I see those things, but before um, social media, Broadway shows would never allow access backstage, uh, you know, between it's, uh, what do you call it? intellectual property, yes. costumes, that's those kinds of things. They want to hold on to those, those secret magic. So they would never allow it. But what happened with Hamilton, and I use Hamilton as, as an example, because it was so brown, groundbreaking in this way, it allowed their cast members to film backstage and get on social media and go live on Instagram and put everybody on their stories and show the audience that this was a fun group of young people, that they were creating something cool and fun. They'd, some of them had no idea, but they were really engaged in the characters that played the characters, the, the actors that played the characters. And so I have a, uh, one of my cast members, um, castmates, Andrew Chappelle, he was a principal standby at Hamilton. He would go because he got paid for what he did and not what, not paid for what he knew and not what he did. That's what I was at Hamilton, I was a principal standby. That meant that anytime the Skylar sisters were not on stage, I would be on stage. So it was really great. I had a lot of time to watch the show and then play around backstage. So I would go backstage and interview people. 
And I'd talk to the audience, I'd take questions, I'd go live, and so offer that access to people so much so that they wanted to come and see the shows. And using social media as an opportunity to, in, a marketing opportunity to entice the audience, to bring them in, they're not going to come and see the show. They can only hear it in the background. And they can see people walking by with wigs and costumes, like, oh my gosh, what are they doing? And also, during the pandemic, you guys, I worked the entire time. I was busy, thanks to the Brown Center for the Performing Arts. Yes. My friend, Timothy Maines, thank God for you. If it hadn't been for you, I would not have known the possibilities of what my little show about Lena Horne could be and how it can make an impact to young students. I did a workshop with, in conjunction with Broward and Dillard High School and it was called The Power of Your Voice. And it exposed these young people to Lena Horne, who is dead and gone, okay? But they realized the struggles that she had gone through and they could even be directly pin it to what this, this narrative that we live in is about. And I also learned a new, a new life for this project that was primarily on, was only on stage and I thank you so much for bringing me into this fold and, exp and exposing me and introducing me to this, your amazing team. Thank yep. you, Tammy. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, yep. Kelly. Yep. Yep. And shout so, out to Lena. I mean, shout, out, shout to out to the ancestors. Lena. Yes, and shout here. out to the ancestors. Yes, we wouldn't be here without them. We wouldn't them. be here. But to answer your question about how we can bring millennials and things like that, Go social media is very, is very uh, an important tool. Yeah. yeah, just just really quickly about just how, you know, just to add to that, just how the theater is just, it's kind of like classical music, man, just, you know, just, just old and just dry. They just need to, right. we just need to open things up. Right, Kids are, right. you know, we have to, and you gotta, we gotta be honest. I mean, classical music is fading away across the country. You know, there used to be a thriving, what, 93.1 back in the days, classical yeah. station. You know, it used to be really thriving. It's, it's fading away. So we have to, like Kev said, we got to educate listeners. We got to yeah. be open to change. And I think not only classical music, but the theater itself, we got to be open to change. We got to try to do different things so we can have these uh, young people to, to, to see how amazing coming to a live show would be. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, we have a live question. We know this guy. Hey, guys. <laughs> Listen, I know I told everybody to just sit listen and take it in but I've been sitting back there and just itching to talk to you guys you are you are bringing so many great things forward and Will's words there's a lot going on up here and I guarantee you we're going to follow up on all the things you brought forward I think the most important thing you're talking about up here that resonates with me is the gatekeeper discussion so and speaking as a gatekeeper, what connected here for the first time for me, just during your discussion up here, is the notion of the colorblind casting. And the, the, the words I want to bring forward to this discussion are the two words, unconscious bias. Okay, and I think one of the biggest things we need to be concerned about and what we're trying to achieve is people who don't believe they are racist but are still making decisions based on race and based on their own unconscious bias. And if we can get to those people, and if you don't know what unconscious bias is, folks in this room, folks watching, you have it, I have it. We all do. We, we need to it. find out what it is and get at it because until you can say, Thomas Jefferson doesn't have to be a white man, you're probably not going to be making all the best decisions you can make about personnel in your organization, about people who are influencing what you're doing, about who you're going to have around you to make the right decisions about how this is all going to go. Unconscious bias is, is at the bottom. And I'm just connecting it now to Cindy and you know the, the things you're saying about um, what's going on with colorblind casting and how it needs to affect staffing. That's the most important thing I heard tonight. Like the light bulb went off and it's connected to that idea of unconscious bias. So even person like me 
doesn't think of himself as racist, is still making decisions that aren't allowing all the right people to come forward. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I wanted to add that to the discussion. I wanted to like share it with you later, but then I realized I got to say it for everybody who's listening. Say it for and everyone. And what's going on. Yeah. 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 No, thank you. Thank you. If you're sitting in a room and the room looks all the same, something needs to change. Yeah. Exactly. You're not getting the full benefit of what it could be. Right? Shakespeare had to cast men as women, remember? We gotta right. go way, 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 way back. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's gotta evolve. We're yeah. evolving for our audiences to evolve. Um, we have a question. What political action would be helpful to advocate for help to support black voices in the arts, not only in Broward, but nationwide? I mean, that's for one, I have to say, just look and see like, like policies. You, you mentioned, you know, um, bright futures and what that looks like and the, the attack on that. Um, and look on a local level, you know, get involved. Just get in, if you get, are getting involved politically and, and the arts is something that you're passionate about, then you advocate for that. You know, you talk to your local commissioners, you know, and, and then you then talk to your state commissioners and state representatives and, and things like that. Uh, be, be a voice. That's when you think about like, like being political, it is being truthful and honest and, and being a voice. So that's the political action that you need to take. Be, get in, just get involved, you know. Be aware. Be aware, be see what's happening and get involved. And then on a, on a micro level, like even, you know, think about, like you say, if you're from Broward County and you wanna know what's happening with your tax dollars, you know, when it comes to the arts, go knock on some doors, go make some calls and ask the mayor, ask, ask the, you know, the commissioners, what's happening with my tax dollars? What are we doing for the arts in my district, in my community? You know, make some noise. Yeah. I also think, I mean, that's on a, a micro level and then your vote and your dollar are the most important thing you can, you have as an, an American in this country. And we are probably the, one of the only countries that doesn't have like an arts commissioner, like arts in like federal office. And it's kind of a bummer because when the pandemic happened, like artists in Europe still got like covered. They were, they got help, you know? And when all of every PAC shut down and there were no tours and there were, all musicians were out of work and performers were out of work, it was like, what do we do? There's no insurance for us. And, you know, that's on, on the macro level, you know, there has to be some sort of systemic shift with my, in my household, we nominate Quincy Jones. We're like, he's gonna be our arts commissioner. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> he's the elder, he knows, you know, he's been through all the generations of everything. Um, but yes, but to, to talk about it on a political level and, and on a micro scale, yeah, knock on the doors, all of it's public record. You know, where's, where is my yep. money going to? I'm glad arts. you brought that up because everybody comes for the reporters. I can't access anything you can't get. Right. It's all online. You want to read the court decision? Feel free to go through all the paper I had to read or all the clicks, 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 clicks. It's all there. Yeah. You, you don't have to believe me. Words. Go look for it yourself. Will, you wanted to jump in there? Um, only thing I would say is, um, you know, we as, as parents and citizens, man, we have power. We, we really, really do. And, um, and I know it's not we don't really treat the arts as we do like sports or whatever, right? And But we have to understand how vital and important it is, just like, you know, football or basketball is, you know, you know, having your kid play basketball and having that interaction and, and learning how to play as a team and all these different things, that's crucial in terms of development. But, you know, we got to understand as well, like the arts is just like, it's crucial, man. It's really, really crucial and helpful. Broadway so actors we, are the biggest athletes I know. When I tell exactly. you we are the exactly. MLS and the NFL of the entertainment industry, <laughs> yes, they, they hit the hardest and paid the Eight least, y'all. Right. Get hit the hardest and paid the least. <laughs> Been saying it for years. <laughs> but yeah, we just gotta we just gotta see the importance of it, man. And we as parents and, and citizens, we have we have power. We just use our voices, man. Make noise. Let's make the noise. Make it, you know, make it known. So whenever they try to cut the budget in any school we got to show up you know what i'm saying god forbid they tried to cut the budget in some football team all y'all would be hollering right. you know what i'm saying right. so 
So we got to right. do the same thing when it comes to the arts, man. Trust me, it, it, you know, and um, it, it, it's, it's a difference maker. It really is. Yeah. Does anyone know the, um, the commissioner of the NFL? I know the, uh, the Super Bowl is watched by everybody in the United States. What if there was a Broadway show for the halftime show? What if there was Hello. a Broadway medley? Yes. Now the producers would all have to get together. We don't have to talk about it. We all get the rights and all that stuff. Well, the dancers are probably all hired from Broadway shows. You know, we could get it done. <laughs> we could fill the stage. Yes. We could fill the field with, you know, if that sort of access, if that sort of exposure to re- Not a bad idea. To, re to revive Broadway as a, or musical theater as a commodity, to get our young people engaged, why wouldn't we do that? You know what I mean? Like, yep. come on, Pepsi. Help As us an out. educator, Darius, what are we losing when we cut the arts? I mean, I don't know how they're going to write the college essay. I just don't. I mean, so you got to have something to write. Going back, I got wrote, I wrote it down a minute because uh, Will had a bar earlier. We were talking about something. Uh, the possibility to dream. He mentioned that. I think that's what we are losing the possibility to dream and if and if our young people don't see the possibility to dream you die you die and it, it may not be a physical death it's a spiritual death it is a death that keeps you mired in the same space you know so when we cut the arts we lose the possibility to dream and then and then so what's crazy is like i'm an artist but i have a degree in finance right um and so the guy you're talking about, you know, I mean, I'm not like, you know, that, that was me. For, Partnership. <laughs> you know, but no, no, I don't, no, no, none of that. I, I'm, I hate it. But, um, um, but, you know, I didn't have role models when I was leaving high school because, you know, I was supposed to go to Dillard High School Performing Arts. I said, nah, I'm going to go somewhere else. And... I went to Boyd Anderson High School. And so, shout out to the co Cobras. I'm going to be like, shout out to the co no, Cobras. Okay, cool. All right. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> so, but I didn't have that. There, there wasn't this real burgeoning arts program there. You know, there was a theater program, but it was like, eh, you know. And, you know, I, I had a teacher who's like, hey, you, you, you're a writer. You should read these books and do this. So I was just doing that on my own. Um, and I went and said, cool, I'm going to be an accountant. You know, and I'll write on the side and figure that out. And, uh, and so I think about the programs that were at my high school then. There weren't these, a lot of these burgeoning programs. And I didn't have these models. I didn't have a me to say, hey, you can do this. I didn't, have a, I didn't know a Will and a Kev to say this. I didn't have a Cindy that said, hey, here's this thing, you know, that you can be. And so I think when we cut these programs, when we, um, we take those opportunities away, we take that that dream because i can look at them and say i can be that you know if that's something that i want to do right and but even i can be something right more than right. than what I, what I even see myself being at the moment and so when we cut it when we when we take that away with that that we we quelch or squelch squelch squelch, yep. quench, quench, squelch. Squelch, squelch i was thinking quench but <laughs> some squelch yep. you know that that dream and we gotta gotta yeah. Poor. To add to add what you're saying, I went to a regular public school. I went to a regular public school. Palmetto Senior High School is a regular public school. When I first moved down to South Florida from New York, I didn't know that magnet schools existed because I went to a public school in New York. And I didn't know that arts were abundant here and they were free. So when I found out that there were school, and I'm from Miami, so when I found out that there were uh, magnet schools like New World or Coral Reef Senior High School, and they were and, and middle schools that were magnet as well, and they were right in my backyard, but I was at the at the point where I was too I moved too late to audition. Right. So I was I went to the school that my family went to, and for the longest time until I got my moment of validation, I always felt behind the kids who went to New World, who went to, to uh, the magnet schools. And then one day I looked up and I looked to my right and I'm being musically directed by Alex Lackamore. I was just about to say, <laughs> shout out to Alex Lackamore, New shout World School graduate. Shout out to Lack. 
you know, musical director of Hamilton, and musical in director, the composer of In the Heights and Hamilton, and now a whole bunch of stuff. Yep. And um, going, oh, yep. it's our passion that makes us equal. Yep. And who also has a hearing aid, wears a hearing aid. And yes, he has yes. a hearing aid. And uh, he wears a hearing aid. Yes. Um, dreaming is, is an amazing thing. Being it's able to, to watch your child dream and to light up. This is a great question to round up tonight. What might any of you recommend as metrics for success to venues that are looking to reflect the demographics of their community? How do we think about programming? How do we become more relevant to our diverse community when it comes to race and ethnicity? I think that the first thing to think about is that you need to have um, a litmus test, uh, so to speak. You know, um, when I think of like kind of a really like, you know, socioeconomically diverse place in South Florida, I think probably like just, you know, you know, everybody, rich, poor, black, white, purple, everybody, right? I think of Sawgrass Mall. That's probably the most, you know, <laughs> just like, you know. Isn't that the biggest, biggest, biggest attraction in the state there's behind a Gucci Disney store, World or Orlando? You know, there's, every, there's a little bit of everything, you know. I would love to walk into a theater here, you know, any, any you know, Kravis Arts here, I walk in and just look around and look like Sawgrass Mall. And then I look on the stage and I look like Sawgrass Mall. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, to me, is the litmus test of what we're all trying to get to. Is like, we just want what happens in the walls of these theaters to look like what happens in the malls. Well, we've you know? talked about and, going and, out into the community. We've yeah. talked about, go, you know, Sis Trunk's right there. Yeah, exactly. And Sis Trunk's right here, you know? Right there. We, we can walk up, there. We grew up on Sis so we, we, like, we already know. So, I mean, like, that's kind of what I think is the, is the litmus test that all theaters and, or any organization that wants to be um, diverse, you know, should be striving for. Yeah, get out into the schools. Get out into the neighborhoods. Um, them. I mean, the word that comes to mind is intentional, man. Um, you have to be intentional about if this is what you believe. You believe that, you know, you know, the theater and, and just organizations need to reflect the community, then be intentional about it in every single way from the top to the bottom. You know what I mean? And, um, and, and yeah, just go for it. You know what I mean? Um, you know, like Kev said, I mean, we perform in theaters across this country. Like, I feel like we perform in every single theater in this country. And um, one of the things that always used to bother me is, because a lot of times when we go to a city or town, I will go out and I'll walk. You know, I'll walk around, whatever, and sometimes I'll, I'll run into random people or even at the hotel, I'll run into somebody that's there. And, and he and the person may say to me, like, hey, man, I saw you in the flyer. Oh, you them guys is about to, you know, do a little thing. Okay. Are oh, y'all playing at the theater over there? Oh, man, that's cool. You know, I ain't never been there. I've been never there. been at the theater. I mean, for 40 years, I ain't never been there. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, yeah, that's that, that hurt me. You know what I'm saying? That bothered me because I'm like, I would love for you to be there. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times I would give them backstage passes to come to the show. But then, you know, I had a conversation with management and, and, and our manager and our booking agent, like, listen, who's marketing these shows? We really got to get into who's, how do you, how, how does this guy doesn't know that I'm here? You know what I mean? And, and that's, the, that's a problem for me, you know, especially going to these cities that they're only marketing to their, um, to, to the donors or, or the individuals that have, you know, you know, season tickets or whatever you know so we have to expand on just the reach who we reach out to you know what i'm saying whether it's you know um collaborating with churches or whatever we have to be able to really reach out and really be intentional about reaching out to the community so the community know that you guys exist and it's going to be tough because again there's a huge trust thing right there's a huge gap and as it relates to trust with the community in the theater, you know what I'm saying? So don't, don't shy away. Just understand if you come up to someone and they're like, you're like, okay, come and check out so-and-so at this theater. They may look at you like you're crazy. They're right? like, you sure I don't have to go see a timeshare? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you know, so it, there's this, this, there's this gap there, but we got to just keep pushing. You got to be intentional and we'll get there. If I could jump in, uh, I mean, Will just took almost everything I was about to say. I'm like, damn, I was, I was ready, I was ready. But um, so it is that intentionality, I think is extremely key. And that is going into the communities, find, because the question was asked about like programming and such, you have to find out what the community wants. Don't just think you, you know better than the community and I'm gonna give you what you, what you want. 
right? Find out, have conversations with community leaders, with, with, with artists that are within the community. Um, connect with the artists in the community, like the Broward Center, being able to bring somebody like me here who is doing the work in the community, right? Like do, do these things, right? That, and be intentional about it and don't let it be just a one-off experience. You know, don't let it just be February or MLK Day or now Juneteenth because everybody's on the Juneteenth bandwagon, right? right? Don't, don't let it just be that. Right, Maybe, and we're, we're, we're a lot of fun when we're in the audience. Absolutely, we talk to the stage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We start a line dance. Yeah, yeah, we want that. Uh, yeah, sit down, sit down, sit down. But no, but yeah, but yeah, you, you got. If you're if you are truly interested, you have to be intentional about it. And we're gonna go back to what was mentioned before about gatekeepers, about the people who are making decisions within the building, because. If you are sit, sitting around having conversations about how do you reach the black community and ain't nobody black in your in the in the space, then you probably gonna make the wrong decision. Right, right. Um, yes, absolutely yes. Um, intention is everything. I think this is now we're at the who, what, when, where, why. Right. We have to. We, we're tackling why we're doing this because we need to include everyone because we need our arts community to reflect what our world actually looks like. So that's why. What, we talked about the what. Um, now we have to approach how and when, right? We have to approach the how and when. So the next conversation is like, okay, this is how we can do it. Um, having people in your marketing team that's not just called urban outreach or community outreach it's such a weird title to me it's just have people of color on your market in your marketing department because it's not just about i have a degree in marketing no the market is like i know a lot of people and i come with a slew of of uh, a community that will come and support things because that's how club promoters did it so if i'm a club promoter guess what i'm ahead of marketing of my own business so you just need to know people who have access to a community of folks that will support the, the work that you're doing, specifically something that people want. Um, and then we, let's talk about when that's gonna roll out because we can chat all day, I know I can, but there has to be some, when, when those things will roll out, this is a long-term thing, you know? We're talking to the, the sixth grader right now this is to benefit the, the sixth grader or the fifth grader coming in and gonna grow up in South Florida and grow up in Broward and, and all of that. So, and be a long-term patron of this performing arts center and others yep. and, and patron of the arts. So uh, it's a matter of like when it's gonna happen, but we've got to talk about marketing, being intentional on the how, what the content is and who we talk to about it. Yep. yep. Final thoughts on anyone as we wrap up. Um. <clears throat> You know, I, first of all, I'd like to thank, you know, Kelly and Jan and everybody on this panel for, um, you know, uh, hosting such a great, you know, uh, moderated discussion. Also, Nikki, thank you so much. She was there from the summer from when we first started thinking about this idea. So it's gl glad that we could see it kind of come to um, fruition. Um, you know, I know that all of us on stage, we all do things in this community and, and, and do this work, you know, all the time, you know, so for our final word, you know, just tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Um, you know, um, Black Violin Foundation, we have um, three new grants that we're opening up. Applications just started the today, was it today? Friday, this Friday, applications open. And last year we gave out eight scholarships um, throughout the country and it's just, you know, different grants and it's for, and um, last year that grant, um, it was unnamed, but this year it's the James Miles uh, Musical Innovation Grant. It's named after our teacher um, from Dillard High School who helped us, you know, just fill a, a few gaps that was so necessary for us to go to college and eventually, you know, fulfill this dream of ours. So um, we also have a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, grant that is, um, you know, we did an interview the other day on um, um, Tiffany Cross at MSNBC and she said something that kind of like stumbled me a little bit when she said it. She said, Said, you know, there's only 4% um, uh, um, black participation in orchestra classes. And I was like, wow, I mean, I knew it was low, but that number when you hear it is just, 
kind of mind boggling. So we're trying to, you know, um, attack that. So we have a DEI um, grant and we also have an instrument drive. Um, we partnered up with uh, the Baroque Violin um, uh, shop and they're donating some instruments. So um, go to blackviolinfoundation.org and then that's how, you know, we try to do it, you know, here in our community and throughout the country. And, so, and, and we're happy to bring this panel to your community. Can I be your agent? Can I all <laughs> yes. of a sudden just take over 100%. and, and uh, put Darius's play on your stage? Um, um, I want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight and thank you to everyone here at the Broward Center for including me. When I left news, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, but I got sick of talking about people, sh our people shot or shackled. And this is why I left to talk to these people about how we can make our community and starting with our corner here in South Florida and hopefully trickle effect across the world. Thank you for tuning in to Arts in Action, Arts for Action, and uh, we look forward to seeing you for future experiences. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you to everybody, Gustavo, Brandy, Kelly, Jen. Thank everybody. you all so much. Everybody, appreciate thank you, guys. you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.